A consortium of civil society organizations has expressed concern that despite President Haga and the Hitchinaba repeatedly committing to safeguarding human rights and the rule of law, actions coming from his appointees are shrinking Zambia's democratic space. At a joint media briefing in Lusaka last week, Chapter One Foundation Executive Director Linda Kasonde, who spoke on behalf of the consortium, notes that recent warring trends have been observed, such as the firing of a Zambia Daily Mail photojournalist for photographing people queuing up for million million dollar and law enforcement agencies thwarting a planned protest by a group of youth against the rising cost of living on October 18th. Chapter One Foundation says such actions not only limit the free flow of information, but also undermines the citizens' responsibility to hold decision makers accountable and create a bad governance environment where citizens as rights holders fear to raise any issues either directly or through the media. Meanwhile, Transparency International Zambia Executive Director Morris Nyambe has called on government and public offices to urgently address the stent on Zambia's democratic image to act in line with their constitutional mandate by serving with fairness. I'll be talking to the Minister of Justice in a short while on Costa this evening. Welcome to Costa. My name is Costa Monsa. My guest this evening is the Honorable Minister of Justice, Honorable Mlam Mohaimbe, MP. We discuss the state of Zambia's current democracy. Are we under threat? Minister, it's always a pleasure to host you. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here and to be able to speak to the key issues around um, our national affairs. Great. So I did, in my preamble, give part of that you know, statement, uh, the consortium on civil society organization, what is your position as government based on these concerns raised that the democratic space is shrinking? Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Costa. Um, uh, first of all and foremost, the most important thing to note as government is that we, we listen. Mm. Uh, we appreciate and understand that CSOs, other different stakeholders, are a critical part of uh, the governance process. Um, uh, th that being said, though, we also would want a situation where um, before uh, allegations that this, the space is shrinking are made, one looks holistically uh, at where we are as a country. For one to say that uh, democracy is shrinking in Costa, it means that we're coming from a better position and now we're getting into a worse position. That could not possibly uh, be true in any way. Uh, and even just the examples that were given, it's, I'm sad to hear um, about uh, a, a Daily Mail uh, journalist, photojournalist uh, being dismissed. I don't know the facts, um, but if uh, what uh, our colleagues are saying from uh, uh, Chapter One Foundation is true, uh, such should not be condoned uh, for a person to lose uh, employment simply because of doing their work in a particular way. However, um, uh, that is an issue which uh, uh, ought to be dealt with uh, by the management, and we, as, as, the, as the government, uh, do not condone uh, that sort of action. Let's not forget that the Zambia Daily Mail is, at the end of the day, um, an institution which is uh, separate and distinct because it's a legal entity. Uh, but again, to stake that and say that it's a demonstration that the de democratic space is shrinking is, I think, to be a little bit um, um, uh, one, w uh, t take a, a, a one-sided look at things because um, rather than a single journalist losing uh, employment, um, uh, no matter how sad that is, where we are coming from, we've seen in situations where entire institutions have been closed down. Uh, we know the story of uh, Prime, Prime TV. We know the story of the Post newspaper. So, so for one to then take a baseline of that nature and compare it uh, now and say there's a shrinking democratic space because um, one journalist, I know it's very unfortunate if that really happened. Uh, it's just uh, we need to compare apples with apples and not uh, apples and pears. Well, Minister, um, the, the argument for most people, and, and I'll, I'll ask this from a legal perspective, is you, you, you say when we say the space is shrinking, we must be comparing from a space of where we're coming from to where we are. Mm. Um, granted, uh, if 
human rights violations and democratic tenets were violated under the previous administration, we can describe it as worse. Should a bad situation under the UPND be considered good just because it's, it's, it's better than what was in the previous regime, but it doesn't meet the, the, the standards. I mean, other examples that, that, that um, the CSOs give, for example, President uh, of uh, Patriots for Economic Progress, Sean Tembo, uh, is intending to write to the ICC uh, the aspect of being you know, held 48 hours before being taken to a court. So many other things that we're seeing. Police curtailing people from, um, you know, holding public gatherings, their freedom and rights to assemble. So would we say that if the PF were worse and the UPND is bad, that's good enough? No, no, that is not the suggestion at all. The, the, the reason why I gave that baseline example is because of the terminology that is being used. For one to say that there is a shrinkage, it means you're saying that we're coming from a better position. And I'm, and I'm simply putting putting it straight, that look, that is not correct um, to, to use that terminology and say there is a shrinkage of the democratic space. And also we're not suggesting uh, as a New Dawn administration that there's, there's a perfect situation. Uh, what we should be looking at as a, as a, as a holistic um, sort of approach to the question of wh whether democracy uh, is, um, is, is improving is, is what gains have we made? Where can we improve? Rather than uh, making startling alleg allegations to the effect that it is shrinking, which is not correct. So, yes, there is room for improvement. Uh, yes, there is room for us to dialogue and put our heads together and give each other ideas as to what things we ought to avoid in order for us to, to have um, a decline in the efforts that are being made. But, but to say it's shrinking, I think, is not correct. And also to address um, the issue of uh, um, uh, Sean Tembo and his, his intention to write to the International Court, um, uh, to the ICC, uh, Criminal Court. Um, of course, every citizen is entitled um, to take whatever steps they believe uh, are, are, are there for them to take in order to protect their rights. Um, there are several, of course, technical questions around whether or not uh, Mr. Tembo's uh, um, uh, intended communicate to the to the uh, International Criminal Court will receive the the attention that it needs to receive. Ha, has he exhausted internal processes? Has ha, ha, is there really anything um, worth speaking about in terms of the alleged violations um, in, in in respect of his civil rights? Those will be questions that the ICC will look at. My, by the way, the ICC deals with genocide level um, type of uh, uh, complaints. It deals with complaints that are of a serious nature. So the, the, his actions will speak for themselves. If indeed the ICC considers that uh, Mr. Tembo has made a prima facie case which uh, requires investigation, and so be it, it will come forth. But also, let's keep in mind that a failure on the part of Mr. Tembo to receive a response from the ICC will, will give us a clear indication as to whether or not uh, his, uh, his uh, engagement of them is vexatious, which mm. I believe is likely to be the outcome. Minister, Two years down the line of the New Dawn administration, a lot of people, including, you know, your supporters, uh, CSOs, and, and, and independent observers, mm. seem to be disappointed with this administration based on your campaign promises. And these promises were not merely just rhetoric, but based on what you, as an opposition, you know, went through. Um, you yourself were denied s several freedoms to, to, to campaign, to address the president himself, and many w w uh, p people were killed and so on. So some feel disappointed now that we're seeing under the UPND this administration doing exactly what was done against it. For example, why would you deny an opposition party from holding a rally and send police officers to go and cordon off the place and, 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 and claim we don't have enough manpower using a political underhand method. These are things we saw under the PF. Are you surely not really sinking solo to go and do exactly what the PF were doing? I, I think I'd beg to differ. First and foremost, we do not do exactly what the PF are doing. Um, that, that is an absolute um, misconception of the situation. Uh, we are 
in this governance seat and we are ensuring that we govern to the best of our ability in terms of observing the rule of law, in terms of ensuring that everybody enjoys within the limits of the law their democratic rights. Now I would like to take your, your question and simply give an example of um, what transpired yesterday. Our colleagues in the, uh, well it's a fraction of the Patriotic Front I believe, uh, had a very lengthy meeting without any disturbance whatsoever at their secretariat with all sorts of views put across on public media across the country and beyond. Not a single one of them was harassed by anyone, not by the UPND, not by the police, the state police, not by anybody other than their own internal issues. I think uh, that is a demonstration of the, the goodwill that this government uh, is governing the affairs of this country with. In the olden times, and I'm sorry, I hate going back to, to olden times, but again it comes back to the narrative of people saying that the democratic space is shrinking. In the olden times, you could not even have a meeting at the UPND Secretariat. Yeah, but, but you would you, be tear gassed and the rest you're of it. You're cherry picking situations. So, no, no. What about in instances uh, where openly the police have denied? They've denied the Socialist I'm, I'm Party, they've there. denied the PF, they've I'm denied General there. Citizens. Yeah, and, and that's why I gave the example that you in particular as an individual, your party went in the opposition. You know these were things that you argued against, uh, took these matters to court as laws and things like that. Why should we see it happening under the UPND? I'm getting there. And so I, I was just giving that yeah. one example. And there will be numerous examples. And, and equally, I could accuse you of cherry picking. Because <laughs> the first thing that you want to look at is the number of meetings that our colleagues have had without interference. We can't run away from that fact. Uh, the Socialist Party, uh, combined meetings, They've taken place without any interference whatsoever. In those instances where we've had a, a situation that the police advises that the proposed public um, a procession or meeting or gathering should not take place, those have been based on certain concerns that the police have communicated to our colleagues and counterparts. That is a, a, the truth and the reality. And our police now even have the um, the, the, the they are informed in terms of the way the Supreme Court determined the case of the Law Association of Zambia versus uh, the Attorney General, in which the Supreme Court guided that where the police are unable to support the holding of a public gathering, the certain steps that need to be taken, amongst them to call the parties, engage them, and ask whether there is a suitable alternative date on which the, the, those events could be held. And these have actually happened. These meetings have actually happened. And many of our colleagues have opted to say, we wanted to have this event on this day, but if you won't allow us to do so, then let's, let, we're not going to have it in any event. So, so it's about engagement and how we apply the law. Mm. It, the, there's also an overriding and overarching fact that, in fact, the, the, the current Public Order Act is the, the same old one. Yes, indeed. We, we, and I'm sure we'll, we'll be addressing that issue. But its application currently is not the way it's been applied in the past. By not just the immediate past regime, but from time immemorial. We, we, we both agree that um, <laughs> all political parties, uh, when they are in the opposition, will stand on a mountain, the UPND inclusive, mm. that we need to repeal and replace the Public Order Act. And uh, when you get into power, um, all of a sudden, the pace at which this moves is, is different. You're talking about, you know, application. Surely, Minister, uh, I, I know that your counterpart at Home Affairs in terms of security tried to address this last week, mm. but what, what is perplexing enough for me is when you say the police don't have the capacity, but yet they send hundreds of officers to go and cordon off a place where a rally was supposed to be held on the basis that they're keeping public peace but cannot support a public gathering mm. when they have that capacity. I, I think Costa... And uh, these are things you argued against yes, yourself. Well, you can't even compare them in any event. We're probably splitting hairs here. Um, the, the, the action of police to, to maintain public order and peace is a complete and separate and distinct issue from them manning a public rally. Very, very different. Uh, and I'll, I'll go back to the example that uh, Chapter One uh, Foundation used. Uh, I took time over the, the young people uh, in your preamble you respect, refer to that uh, so that we just don't talk about uh, political parties. Uh, we see a, a broad and holistic picture. I took time to look at the media reports around uh, this group that was calling themselves protest uh, movement. Uh, young people who uh, were, were intending to hold uh, a demonstration on Wednesday, 18th October, the National Day of Prayer and Reconciliation. Um, and um, 
prior to them approaching court, these uh, our young people actually engaged with the media. And uh, this is what they said was their intention, that uh, they want to assemble citizens to join a fuel protest on the day mentioned with the goal of getting thousands of youth to renounce the rising cost of living in the country. Now, there's nothing wrong with that in itself, in and of itself. But listen to that. Thousands of youth to renounce and, and these are supposed to gather at one place. Now, the reason that this particular procession was not held, the um, Mr. Malama, I believe, from Zambia Police engaged with uh, the, this particular group and informed them that we are not able to support this uh, particular event because you have not met the imperatives that are set out in the law as to how to organize a public uh, gathering of this nature. One of the key issues that was raised was that they did not demonstrate that they had enough marshals to be able to ensure that the event takes place. And Mr. Malama then informed them that if you're not happy with the decision we have taken, you go and appeal to the Minister of Home Affairs. Now, the colleagues are taking this as an example of uh, uh, d democratic space shrinking, uh, to use the expression. But in all honesty, uh, in all honesty, beg pardon, you can see that the initial intention was to bring thousands of people. And if you are not able to manage those thousands of people, how do you expect the police to support an event of that nature? This is just one example but, 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 but where we're looking at uh, things from one side of the coin instead of looking at it holistically. And the issue that they're discussing, Costa, we all know, they intended to discuss, we all know, is a a very emotive issue. It's a very sensitive issue around the well-being, the but, cost but, but, of living. But, but which is just a fact. It is a fact. That, but listen to the point that I'm making. The point is that there are two sides to every coin. The, they cannot just say the police stopped these individuals from having a procession of this nature. And I remember I, 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 I prefaced this discussion by saying there's nothing wrong with the intention of the parties themselves. But where there's a clear demonstration that there is likely to result public disorder from the holding of a procession, I think all of us are duty-bound to, to, to protect uh, mm. our, ourselves Minister, and the citizenry. Would I be right, or maybe let me ask directly, why do we seem to have breaks on the process to repeal and replace the Public Order Act? I heard, you know, Vice President Mutalina Lumango during a question and answer session of the Vice President on, uh, on the floor saying, this is the same Public Order Act we, we inherited. Uh, are you happy with it? now that, that you're in power? You see nothing wrong with it? Um, there are no breaks uh, to start with the, the enactment of the public, uh, uh, now to, to be known as pu public gatherings bill. In fact, I've, I've said this on many platforms, the progress that has been made by this administration far outstrips the progress that had been made prior, whether in the immediate past or before. Why do I say this? All our predecessors simply looked at possibly amending. In fact, all that has ever been done is an amendment to that particular piece of law, one of which was forced on account of a decision of the Supreme Court in the Christine Mulundika case. We have taken a different approach. We have said we are repealing and replacing this law completely. I think that it deserves kudos because it, the evidence is there. The Zambia Law Development Co Commission did a report, did a draft bill, and it was submitted. And now instead of even calling it the Public Order Bill, which is an old nomon culture which comes from our, our uh, colonial heritage, we are talking about public gatherings. In a, in a completely different way. That in itself entails that uh, we have to make sure that we do not leave anything out in that particular piece of legislation. The current delay, as far as I'm aware, is in relation to, for example, to the appeal pro, uh, provisions in the uh, public gatherings bill. What am I saying? We've gone above and beyond by the fact that we are taking this old legislation completely and we're talking about a repeal and replacement. Yes. I agree that there is a delay, that it has taken longer than people are expected. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is a reason to that. There is, there is a, 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 a basis upon which uh, we can safely say that uh, time has been taken in order to get this law right from the word go. But, but uh, you are Minister of Justice and have the privilege of receiving so many drafts of these bills and presenting them uh, through to cabinet you know, taking them, you know, to Parliament. Uh, some of these things uh, we were promised by the UPND that, that you knew what was supposed to be done. Um, so, 
and we've seen other things move faster. You've you, you, you've removed the death penalty. You've uh, just last week, I think I was watching you on Friday, looking at the criminal procedure, you know, called in Parliament. Mm. Um, I, I'm, I'm failing to understand where the sticky or bottlenecks are to, to the Public Order Act. Yes, because we, we, we because you're not the first administration to attempt on this. Mm. Yet you're saying you've gone by far. So wh where is the roadblock? So again, I'll, I'll re repeat so as to reiterate. Um, in the past, uh, our counterparts who had the the the, uh, the benefit, um, the the duty of running the affairs of the country, um, only went that far in terms of amending piecemeal the proposed um, uh, Public Order Act, and those never even came to pass. We're saying we're taking the whole act that was there in the past and replacing it with a new one. That is the basis upon which I'm saying that we've gone above and beyond, and. Um, in terms of comparing uh, the various pieces of legislation that have gone on the floor of the House in terms of, for example, I think you've given, um, uh, you've talked about the amendment to the uh, penal code. Th there's a dis this huge distinction between amending, uh, yes, and, amending and completely replacing. Yeah. And, and of course, no, no two pieces of legislation can be compared uh, in terms of uh, what processes they must undertake. Some are more complex than others. Uh, some are in relation to the economic affairs of the country. And by the way, that will also explain to you why we've taken certain pieces of legislation in a hurry to the floor of the House, because uh, we are clear that we want to ensure that our law is responsive to the needs of the people, to the needs of our economy. So you'll find, for example, that will rush the public uh, private partnership bill um, to Parliament to, 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 to try and ensure that we help making make this economy um, uh, tick. So, so, so yes, it may seem like a bit of a long-winded answer, uh, but uh, the reality of the matter is that each of these pieces of legislation nonetheless uh, receive full attention from the line ministers who of course propose them and then of course as an, on our part as well as Ministry of Justice. So as Minister of Justice, can you tell the nation this evening where are we at with the Public Order Act and what is your timeline in terms of when we can see it come to fruition? Because the challenge uh, when it comes to the Constitution, the Public Order Act, the freedom of information, the access to information, my God, these are things that I enter journalism and I'm still talking about them and there's no light at the end of the tunnel. Um, there is light at the end of the tunnel. It seems and, the tunnel has bended somewhere. <laughs> and interestingly, uh, you, 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 what you've just said is, is of crucial importance. Um, access to information law from 1998. Uh, but now we are seeing activity in terms of we are actually going to see these laws uh, see the light of day. I cannot, unfortunately, with regard to the Public Order Act, give any particular timeline. Uh, because, as I said, the process of consultation is still ongoing. There are those two items that I mentioned specifically. It could be now during the budget session. It could be in the next session. I do not know. Has the final honest. draft been presented to justice? Uh, are we yet to get a, uh, this cab thing going to the cabinet? For, well, I don't know. I'm aware that uh, the Honourable Minister of Home Affairs took it back for further consultation mm -hmm. on those aspects that mm -hmm. I referred mm -hmm. to. So uh, following that process, the, the draft has not come back to us yet. Um, but again, as I said, it's work in progress. As for the access to information uh, law, all I can say is watch this space. Well, we, like I said, I've heard that ever since I joined or I started practicing. So I, I, I hope I don't retire while watching <laughs> this space. But, but, but let's, let's speak from a layman's perspective uh, on the Public Order Act b before we leave it. Mm. Um, despite a lot of legalities that may be involved in, in repealing and replacing, f from a layman's perspective, the contention has always been the issue of one obtaining a permit or rather that I need as a citizen to, to notify. Sit, to, uh, 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 I need to get permission when the law says notify the police and then people argue that this is obviously a breach of my constitutional freedoms. Th this, is, this has always been the thing. Do I need to get permission from the police or should I notify them? My question is, what is the new Public Gatherings Act proposing uh, around this, this, this clause in mm. terms of what should be the, what is the proposed new piece of legislation? Okay, so the Christine Mundika case made it absolutely mm. clear mm. Uh, that uh, 
any piece of legislation that requires a citizen to obtain permission, a permit, mm. uh, in order to exercise their freedoms, uh, especially freedom of, of assembly, freedom of expression, etc., um, is ultra uh, It's It's contrary to the provisions of the, uh, the Bill of Rights in the Constitution. So the public gathering bill, when it does come, I expect we will have to abide by the, the old, old uh, 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 the old, old precedents uh, and the old guidance that was given by the Supreme Court in the Christine Mundika case. Even as we speak now in the Public Order Act, uh, there is no provision that requires a citizen to get permission. It's simply notification. Uh, and, and essentially, that, that is where the crux of the matter is. But, but, but how then are we proposing to improve this based on precedents? On, on precedents sorry, we notify? Do we go ahead when the police are not there? Because uh, even now, uh, one may argue that um, from the Mulundika case, precedence has been set and that becomes mm -hmm. law, but we still go against it. Um, well, basically, um, and this is why, again, I mentioned the Law Association of Zambia and Attorney General case. Yeah. That clearly spells out what ought to be done in the event that the police are unable to uh, provide support for, the, for a public gathering. Uh, the reason why you have this situation is because there's a very fine balance and it will always be there. And this is perhaps where uh, we take the opportunity to, to speak to our colleagues who are in leadership positions, to speak to our fellow citizens, that there's a very fine balance uh, between uh, a, a public procession and event uh, and uh, the, the, the public order side of things. We all will appreciate that it's very easy uh, for a public procession to become a riot. Mm. Uh, and, and this is where we have to be responsible as citizens. Uh, a situation where uh, a, a political party, due to its own internal strife, uh, say, say to the public that we must all rise up, we must cause a shutdown of the running of the affairs of the, ca of the country. Is that a, a situation which we want uh, as, as Zambians to accept and say this is normal, this is how the affairs of the country should be run, all because of an internal strife of a political we'll, party? We'll, we'll be coming to that, but, but, but when one or two cases begin to happen and become the order of the day, surely, Minister, you should be getting you know, worried. Mm. I, I want to again just cherry pick one or two examples. If police go to a Mr. Sean Tembo's home to arrest him mm. over a post on Facebook mm. that he says, I'm waiting for my lawyers, why should police break down his doors? I mean, he hasn't uh, rejected arrest or, or appearing just for a call out. He says, I'm waiting for my lawyers. That is within his rights. Um, why should the police behave that way? Secondly, away from even a political party, before Mr. Edgar Lungu uh, uh, d decided to announce that he's coming back into active politics, we saw a scene where he wanted to congregate on the copper belt. He was stopped from, from, from going to church. Um, how, how do we reconcile this? Hmm. I'm, I'm not aware that he was stopped from going to church. I think there is a, a different narrative out there. Uh, but but let's suppose that that did actually transpire in the manner that that it suggested. He was turned away. We covered that uh, line. Uh, yes, he was yes. turned away by police. Uh, Let's suppose that it actually happened in the manner that it's, uh, it's, it's said to have happened. I, I did say Costa right from the word go, and I think the Honorable Minister of Information um, uh, did address that particular concern. They, we're not going to uh, sit here and go on the top of a hill and say that we've not made any mistakes. That would be a complete and total lie. There will be situations in the governance of the affairs of the country where some of the individuals uh, who are expected to execute certain offices do not do so correctly. And the important thing is, from a governance perspective, for us to hold our hands up and say, no, that was not correct, let it not repeat itself. So in, in, in so far as any citizen, maybe not even Mr. Mr. Lungu, any citizen has their rights abrogated in one form, shape or another, and it comes to the attention of the executive arm of government, we are very quick and we'll say, that should not have been done, that was incorrect. So in so far as that possibly could have occurred, I will be the first one to say right on a public pl platform such as this mm -hmm. that let's not do that. That is the old way of doing things. We do not do that. Thank you, as the new uh, government. But uh, the other is uh, so, so with Sean it, Temple, it, if I can breaking um, beer. Yes. So so the 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 laws of Zambia 
give permission to law enforcement agencies, including the Zambia police, um, to use the appropriate level of force to apprehend a person who is accused of having committed a criminal offense. When is that done? In the face of an offense taking place, or where there is a serious offense that has taken place, murder, aggravated robbery, and so on and so forth, you know that the different levels of force that are used. In the case of Mr. Tembo, I am aware that he was invited to the police station. He did not show. I think it was a couple of days he was ignoring the police. In those circumstances, he put himself in the same position as that of a fugitive. The police had to use the appropriate level of force in order for him to be apprehended. If he had simply cooperated, there would have not been a challenge. And let's not remember, that, let's not forget the posting in itself by Mr. Tembo, which is completely un-Zambian, which resulted in that particular incident. Completely un-Zambian. Never seen before this kind of approach to politics. You want to insult and use all sorts of derogatory language instead of simply getting your point across. His saying that he needed his lawyers to be present is, is yes, you are entitled to have your legal practitioner present when an uh, arrest is being effected. But it's not in all situations where the, the police will have to wait for a suspect's legal practitioner to come through before they can effect an apprehension. By the way, there's a significant difference between the two. An arrest also and the, the issuing of one and caution statements and so on and so forth is completely different um, from simply effecting and apprehension. So are you Can supporting you imagine that the, the force, excessive force used by the, there was the no police service force. to break down locks and to break down someone's property who is not do. resisting arrest? Oh, but why was he locked in if he's not resisting Waiting arrest? for his legal... No, that is resisting. Waiting for his legal <laughs> no, no, you know, representation. That is resisting. If the lawyer is not immediately available, there would be need to effect the apprehension in certain situations, such as that one. I, in my considered view, the Zambia police were deliberately put in a situation by an individual who could see them. He, they had identified themselves but opted to lock himself in. Were can you, professional? Can you still, imagine? I mean, you, you're a lawyer yourself. You've but, covered so many criminal cases. Where is yes. the conduct of the police profession? They are entitled to undertake such an action within the law. So now let me tell you what I have encountered in the past where my accused person's client I'm not able to make myself available for the process of apprehension. What we would do is to tell them, colleagues, it is not within the law for you to resist this process. Can you please quickly make yourself available to the police to avoid any sort of unnecessary harm coming to you? And then we will follow you to the police station and pick up from there. That is what happens in normal circumstances. And we used to do this so many times. You advise your client instead of misadvising them. You advise them, make yourself available. Because failing to do so, amounts to the what we've exactly mentioned, which is resisting arrest. You can imagine this gentleman is taking a video of police officers who are warranted by law to apprehend him, and he's saying, no, wait for my lawyers. Instead of simply saying, colleagues, uh, let us cooperate with one another. I will accompany you now. Please make sure that I, I'm put in a place where my lawyers will be able to see me. So he deliberately put the police in that situation. Whether or not it is professional uh, is a matter of opinion for all of us. Mm. But, 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 they did not act outside the law. That's the most take, important thing. When we thing. take a position, for example, um, that um, whatever he posted is a, is is unzambian and unthinkable, aren't we being prejudicial to wait for the courts to determine? Isn't this why the police are acting in that manner with such statements? People believe that. Uh, people in power like yourselves are sending the police to behave in such a manner. No, that because the, 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 he's he's innocent until proven yes, guilty. Right, right. Mm. But that doesn't mean I can't have an opinion on what he posted. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any role to play in the in the in the arrest process yeah. in the in the criminal justice process from A to Z. I'm a simply a member of the executive who is entitled to my views as a Zambian. And the reality but your of opinion it is from, extremely powerful. You have well, well, no, that doesn't work that way. Otherwise, uh, every day you would have a situation where I say I don't like Costa. Mm. 
and he's probably committed an offense and they'll come and pick you up. You don't see that happening. The reality is that everybody knows their professional role, including the courts themselves. In fact, the judiciary is trained to, to filter out any of this sort of uh, outside influences, be it from uh, a politician like myself or from any other uh, source. The media uh, are always giving their views on matters uh, of different nature, but the courts are able to, 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 to step away from that. So I, I do not think that it's being prejudicial in any way. If I had a role to play in the, in the criminal justice process, um, if I was DPP, for example, and I made a statement like that, yes, mm. that would be questionable, but well, not as Minister The last time I hosted you, uh, and I'll uh, we'll move away from the public order, actually, I asked you, you know, this question. Um, following recent, you know, happenings, uh, former President Edgar Lungu announcing his return to active politics, mm. um, government subsequently uh, announcing that uh, you were withdrawing uh, some of his privileges uh, based on the Benefits Act. Mm. Obviously, the, the, the taxpayers' money you draw from allowances and other privileges mm. as, as a former head of state. Um, from a legal perspective, Minister, is this a good piece of legislation for, for our country? Because when you look at history, uh, one uh, would tend to feel we designed this piece of legislation to to to, to out to keep President Kaunda in 1996 away from coming back, because how, how do we reconcile the fact that I'm a citizen with constitutional freedoms or freedom to to to, to assemble, freedom to express my opinions and views, uh, the fact that I'm a former head of state gags me from speaking on issues of my country. Not in particular to Mr. Lungo, I'm just saying, as a country, is this a good piece of, of legislation? Um, it has its pros and cons. Mm. Um, certainly from the perspective of our current president, Mr. Hijlema, he's made it absolutely clear that for me, don't apply this act to me in terms of receiving those benefits. So, so there are pros and cons. The, others would ask the question, should they be receiving that lifelong benefit after all? Because it, they did their job, they served, and they knew what they were getting into. Um, I, I, as to the aspect of uh, uh, the, the um, particular piece of legislation, withdrawing uh, benefits from a, from a former head of state who goes back into active politics. I think the logic that the drafters of the law then, uh, by the way, the, the last amendment was uh, in 1998. To this, for the Benefits to this Act. Yes, for the Benefits Act. I think the logic was uh, why should the citizens um, continue finance. to pay and finance a, a, an individual who um, is not retired? Because the whole essence of these benefits is to say you are now retired and this is what our, we as a people will give you. And the benefits are many. Um, free vehicles, uh, uh, drawing salaries for, 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 for workers in the, in the house, uh, diplomatic passport, and all these various benefits. Uh, Zambia Police uh, Service uh, uh, providing security 24-7 and the rest of it, and paying the rent uh, or building a house for this particular former president. So it, 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 it's, it's um, counterproductive. Uh, for one to say uh, I'm retired and then to still then be active nonetheless. But, but, but in this day and era, and I'm sorry, I, I find it a bit within the legal sense absurd that, that we can have such a, a law crafted uh, without foresight. I, I mean, it, it's like when one is head of state, uh, after you serve even one term or two terms, you're forced into retirement, uh, just despite your... It's, it's, it's like we're not having a foresight. Well, I, I, I wouldn't call it forced into retirement. By the way, the law in no way gags um, a former head of state, state from speaking. All the law says specifically is, please don't be in active the, 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 politics. That's why, the, the, that's why I'm challenging this particular yes. piece of legislation. Minister, uh, what if I have served one term, mm. I, I st I'm still young and I still want to continue in active, you know, politics. The fact is, I'm still a, a former head of state. Um, yes, you're still a former head of state, you, you but, can't but get you're, away you're not retired. And, and people must live, learn to live and abide by their choices. It's mm. a matter of choice. It doesn't mean that because you're still young, you're still, still viable, you still feel viable and so on and so forth, that you should then uh, burden the people of Zambia with keeping you... Uh, looking after you. In fact, I, was, I, I listened to one of the radio stations at lunchtime news, um, and it was interesting. Sakwad have taken a position with regard to this very issue. The, the view that they seem to take is that if you know that you, you, you 
you are still active in politics and you make a particular representation to the secretary to the cabinet to say I'm no longer active then you come back and turn around having drawn all these benefits it's as though you are obtaining a pecuniary that, advantage. That's in the Lungu case, but I'm, I'm, I'm basically talking <laughs> and, about and this, so, this, this particular yes. act. And last time I did give you this example, mm. um, we see this happening in, in, in some of these developed countries and democracies that we may borrow from. Mm. Um, I gave an example of President Trump, for example, President Obama. Mm. Um, we know President Trump is actively for the run to bounce back with the Republicans, but he's still accorded the privileges of security and, and the, the CIA detail and, uh, 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 and so on, because he's still a former head of state, whether we like it or not, it's a fact. True, but does President Trump uh, live in a, a government paid for house? <laughs> does, it, does he have his workers and the, the, the people who, who service him from day to day uh, being paid for by the state? If you see President Trump traveling, he doesn't travel in uh, state uh, uh, state uh, vehicles. Yes, there will be a security detail. That, that has got a lot to do with the the peculiarities of, of the country there. Uh, but he will, he will fly in Trump 1, his own aircraft. He will drive in his own vehicle. This is where we, we sort of miss it. I, I agree with you to a large degree that a former president is a former president. Um, but I, I think you and cannot, be you cannot certain compare um, uh, uh, different jurisdictions as to what they are. The logic of the framers of this act, and by the way, before we are misunderstood by the people of Zambia out there, we did not no, frame this oh, act. Oh, this oh, 1998 no, act. That, that's why <laughs> So, so that's why I, I went back yes. based on what was happening. And, and, and I don't even want to look at the mm. Lungu case. I'm just looking at a scenario where I'm saying, uh, I'm custom once and at 40, I become president. Mm. I serve for five years. I'm still fresh. I want to come back. Uh, I, I'm, I was head of state for five yes. years. Uh, I should be accorded certain privileges and benefits. True, true very um, true. But should I be forced into retirement just to enjoy this? It's them? not being forced into retirement. Let's be clear what the law says. It says if you are retired, then you receive these benefits. I think it's, it's we're really splitting hairs at the end of the day. Um, the, the, the core issue is what does the law provide? Currently, the law is very, very clear that, look, if you want to come back to active place, it's your choice. Nobody is going to stop you. It's your democratic right if you have uh, the, the, the wherewithal to say, I'm coming back to politics. But we also must accept that the consequence under our law, as it currently reads, is that you are stripped down to being a normal, ordinary citizen. And why should you uh, suffer? Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm using the term very loosely. Yes. You become an ordinary citizen. Exactly. So, I just, I just want to ride her there because mm. the Minister of Information did uh, make a comment on this. So I just want to be clear. President Lungo's announcement, uh, when, when you say he's now being considered as an ordinary citizen, what exactly has government withdrawn the, from the, his privileges? The act itself mm. specifies, um, the law itself specifies, and, and people can go and read the provisions themselves so to avoid thinking that I'm uh, misleading them. The, it provides very clearly what the benefits are for a former president mm. who has retired. Uh, and I hinted to some of them, diplomatic passport, uh, security detail, uh, vehicles to be used, and so on and so forth. Uh, those are specified in the law. So as soon as uh, one ceases to uh, to hold the status of a retired president, that is what is taken uh, away. And uh, the status of former president, of course, remains, and they will be accorded the treatment of a former president at appropriate uh, functions and so on and so forth. <laughs> if you see, for example... There lies um, where many people are failing to reconcile. Mm. So we are stripping him down to an ordinary citizen. He's stripped, they would have stripped themselves down. By well, making that so, so, so the act, by virtue of him returning to active politics, strips him down to being an ordinary citizen. But we'll, re we'll accord him respect as a former head of state. Yes, the, the, the two are not mutually exclusive in mm. any way. Mm. It's simply about the benefits, that's all. And when I say strip down to an ordinary mm. citizen, I do not mean uh, that you, you, you start to say he never start in that office. It doesn't mean that he will be disrespected as an individual simply because of the fact that he's not receiving benefits. It's only about benefits here. Nothing more, nothing less. And, and that is where we should look at it. Instead of the people of Zambia paying for a house for a retired person. In fact, they were saying, no, 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 since you have said you're not retire, come back, do your politics in case you, you are able to, to stand. If you are eligible to stand, you stand again, you become president again, you 
enjoy the benefits of being president. At the appropriate time, when you retire again, you get you get to be to enjoy the benefits. It's very very simple. It's a matter of personal choice. Let's not forget that. It's a matter of personal choice. Mm. In the same same way that His Excellency, the current president, has said very clearly at the end of my tenure when I've served, I don't want to be accorded any of these things. I've got my own house. I've got my own cars. I'm able to live and survive. I think for me, instead of talking about uh, the person being still a president and so on and so forth, I think this is where we should be heading as Zambians and say, how sustainable is it for us to be able to build houses, to rent houses, going forward for all our former presidents? I would give kudos to President Hijilema for being able to be visionary enough and say, you know, this is not uh, the way the way I want to go. Well, we, Whether or not we, we, we are men the law, we are yet to cross that bridge. <laughs> Whether or not we are men the law is that, another issue. We are yet to cross that bridge. No, no, but, but the principle has we, been We are yet down. to cross that bridge, just like President Lungu has u turned We've seen a lot of politicians no, but, but, but on 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 their commitments. And, and yes, Costa. Mm -hmm. But but the thing is that one must be able to give kudos for a person who is giving clear clarity of thought of that nature and say, colleagues, I have already got these particular things. Why must I take more from the people of Zambia who are already mm. struggling? Well, well, I think it's commendable, whichever way you want to look at it. When that announcement by former President Lungu was made, um, I saw quite a number of uh, interpretations and, and, and opinions and mm. comments around the consequences of, of what that meant. Partly we've touched on the Benefits Acts and mm. what it means. Mm. Others now said this is an automatic removal uh, of his uh, immunity. Let's just enlighten the public uh, yes, you know, you. on that because I know there have even been questions to you. Yes. Uh, is government, it's like government was waiting for something and so thirsty to no. remove <laughs> you know, President, former President Lungu's immunity and um, with the new law, uh, I mean with the amendment to the constitution, um, I think people have misunderstood that a, a former president is not immune to investigation, he's not immune to arrest, but can be immune to prosecution in certain aspects. Can we, you know, guide yes. us through? And, and that's an important question. I'm glad you've actually raised it. The immunity that a former president enjoys is in respect to the period <coughs> in which he served. So prior to that, the president is does not enjoy immunity for his actions, and post his taking um, his leaving office, he does not enjoy immunity for his actions. That that is the first thing mm -hmm. that we must make absolutely clear. So even from the the after the 12th August election, from from that point to where we are today, almost three, two and a half years down the line, uh, there was no immunity for the former president for his actions during this period that we're talking Post about. Post the election. Post the election. So if he had committed a criminal offense, his his can be taken to task uh, for, for that com criminal offense. Um, let's make that absolutely clear. Then in terms of the immunity that he enjoys in relation to the period that he served, I, I think I would disagree very strongly that government is thirsty. Uh, or was thirsty or is waiting for something um, in order for that immunity to be lifted. That immunity could have been lifted at any point in the last two, three years. And I've spoken about that issue on this platform. That for us, we've got better things to do. Um, if the people of Zambia do determine that they want that done, if the law inf enforcement agencies determine that there is a prima facie case, uh, and, and by the way, he's not immune to investigation, because that's the only way you can determine whether he did wrong in the mm -hmm. first place. So it, it's a it's it's a, it's a no-brainer in terms of that particular aspect. If that is determined at an appropriate time, Parliament will deal with it. But as for this period from 2021 to date, we've not found the necessity to do so. So why, is, would, is, is, is uh, former, why would he simply is, come is, back is, to is active for, politics? Is, is former President Edgar that? Lungo under investigation en route to finding a prima facie case, en route to lifting his immunity? I ask this because he has made a challenge to your administration saying, you're going after my children and my wife, peeling me like an onion. It's me you're after. Just come after me. Well, if, if he knows he's done something, then maybe that's why he's making those statements. Um, but to my knowledge, I'm, I'm not aware, of course, the investigating teams uh, do so uh, from a completely independent, perspe independent perspective. So I, I'm not aware, um, speaking from the executive uh, uh, point of view, of any active uh, matters in terms of investigation of the head of state. That can change because the law enforcement agencies are the ones that determine uh, when to investigate, when to prosecute, and 
so on and so forth. Um, as for uh, the, the, the challenge, as you put it, of the former president, uh, he seems to believe that because the, um, he, the people close to him are, are close to him, uh, that they also enjoy the immunity that he enjoys. He, he seems to believe that they, they should not be prosecuted for wrongdoing. I, I think that's absolutely wrong. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's uh, an attempt to gain sympathy for him to then use these investigations against individuals in their own capacity with, who are adults, by the way, um, uh, as a means of gaining public sympathy. I think I, 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 that's what I meant to say. The matter to do with the former First Lady, for example, is almost entirely a matter of as a member of the public, who I believe is a member of their family, is the one who came to the police and said, ah, this is what has transpired. By the way, this is in court, uh, so I can't say too much. What has that got to do with, with, the, with, with the state in any way? An, as an individual talked about this offense having been committed and used their right at law to report uh, the, the commission of that offense. How does the state come in at all? So I think some of these statements that are made, the challenges that are given, uh, are simply in an attempt um, to go around uh, the, the criminal justice process by gaining public sympathy. But, of course, we do not um, in this country have any law that allows for such uh, an approach to be taken. Matters are tried based on evidence and based on the law. Mm. Nothing more, nothing less. Mm. Sometime back, Minister, uh, you and I shared platform at a forum in public and, and we discussed the rate at which the corruption fight was going on and you admitted that uh, you know fighting corruption is a complex mm. you know issue you were asking the zambians to 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 to, to be a bit more patient are you happy because there's a bit of uh, you know discontent in the public there that probably th this fight against graft is moving you know quite slow uh, i saw a posting just last week by the sec you know board chairperson state council musa when you say if we're really serious about fighting corruption the aspect of declaration starting from the head of state to them uh, you know must be serious people just feel that it's it's, it's, a, it's a smoke screen there's nothing happening i mean even cases such as the the, 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 the big Goldgate scandal has, has gone quiet. People are losing confidence in, in, in the UPND's commitment towards the graft fight. Are you happy at the pace at which we are moving and the, and the successes being made, if at all, any? Um, I take the view that um, with all things being equal, uh, the, any criminal justice process, uh, including the specific cases uh, relating to um, economic and financial crimes, need to move at lightning pace. But that has to be tempered against the need to do justice. And an accused person before a court has got rights that they enjoy. So you see many of these cases are actually um, movement is not as quick and steady as it ought to be on account of those uh, accused persons uh, in, uh, ensuring that their rights are protected to a fair trial, to full hearing, and so on and so forth. So if you, Costa, you're facing a, a, a criminal matter, even in the economic and financial crimes uh, court, uh, and it's a day for you to put your defense across comes, and you say, I'm not feeling uh, that I am uh, ready for my defense. I've got witnesses in Kawompo that need to be brought. I don't have the money to bring them now, or it will take some time to bring them. The, there's very little that the, the court can do without trampling on your rights um, in order to force you to begin your defense. So there has to be a degree of uh, a room built into the process, uh, what, what, we, what is often referred to as um, uh, the benefit of doubt. And this is where we're seeing many of these cases being bogged down. You have a situation where even the prosecution, I'm not going to speak on a, from a one-sided perspective, even the prosecution say, we need a little bit more time to gather this evidence, uh, which, uh, not gather, but to bring this evidence, because by then it have been gathered already, to bring these witnesses, and so on and so forth. It is part of the process of criminal justice in our country for all matters where we see delays from time to time. Another aspect that is a challenge is the fact that we have uh, very limited infrastructure in uh, our court system. Uh, magistrates share courts, courtrooms, judges uh, share some of the facilities. So what we are doing in answering your question more specifically is we're not sitting back and simply saying these are taking long. Uh, let's 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 just watch. No, we have put in place. Uh, 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 
not only mechanisms but also uh, new infrastructure is in the way it almost being uh, uh, commissioned uh, on the way to being commissioned and this infrastructure will allow specialized courts like the economic and financial crimes court which deals with corruption matters to be more efficient we are also in the process of promulgating rules i think you, you mentioned for example that we have an amendment of the um uh, criminal procedure code and the cpc which we're dealing with on uh, and the pc the penal code which we're dealing with on friday that is in a way to try and ensure that we ad amend the laws to give some of these provisions a quicker resolution uh, through the rules of court themselves mm. I, I think the challenge minister is that um, the, the way things happen in our country is that uh, uh, people are tried in the public eye, so mm. per se. Uh, what do I mean? When, when people are being arrested, and especially politically exposed persons, there's this whole media frenzy, press conferences called by, you know, uh, investigative wings, sort of like, like they've already secured a conviction, not, not really specifying that there'll be a, a, a long winding court process. This creates public anxiety. I, 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 I'm giving you this one example. The country came to an entire standstill with the gold scandal at the airport. Uh, the president had to call a press conference and say, wait and see what will come out. Mm. And the case has just gone cold. <laughs> well, so so I, I know you're not the court, but out of public interest, people will be asking, Minister, where are we? I mean, we don't know where the Egyptians are. We don't know what has happened because of the, the anxiety and the excitement that was created. And it, it, it happens. Helicopters brought in, um, arrests made. People are told to have 50 houses. Then these cases just go cold. Uh, yes, Costa. Um, I think we, all, we also need to understand that sometimes we are not... Um, very genuine to ourselves as a people. Mm. If the law enforcement agencies do not give updates when they are undertaking some of these actions, the first people to cry are ourselves and say there is no transparency in this process. Mm. So again, it's a balance, it's a, it's a dichotomy. We want to ensure that we are informed. Um, but then at the same time, when information is given, we, we now use that as a basis for make, uh, question marks. The, the, the process of trying individuals and investigating cases is a very delicate one. Uh, you can't go across and say, oh, these individuals, they are now being held at uh, such prison, and this is what's happening, it's strategically talking about the nuances of all these cases that are going on. I can assure you that the gold gate scandal, as you call it, is, has not gone quiet. It's not dead in any way. I think very recently the DPP announced certain measures that had been taken. And uh, it's not always about, um, first of all, securing that conviction. No. It is sometimes about ensuring that steps are taken to secure assets that eventually are forfeited to the state. So talk about the, the helicopters issue. You know, for example, these matters are still in court, so I'm skirting around the edges. But you know, for example, that the, the, the director of public prosecutions applied for non-conviction-based forfeiture. And that, again, as I said earlier, process has to go through the mail. It has but, to but run through the mail. But the aspect of the transparency that you talk about, mm. Minister, in the Goldgate scandal, people speculate now, because why I say it's cold, there's no information coming through that the Egyptians have even been flown back the suspects mm. and as you say it's speculation <laughs> It's speculation. So you would confirm so, that, that they're still in custody? Well, I, I can't confirm or deny or whatever the case may be, but it's, it's, we'll all be speculating because even myself, I do not have that information around what the, the law enforcement agencies are doing in terms of uh, the prosecution investigation mm. of, of cases. They enjoy independence uh, mm. and uh, uh, that must always be remembered. Finally, Minister, we, we've just won, run out of time. Um, one question that needs clarification. Uh, three weeks ago, uh, uh, the Minister of, of Mines and Minerals Development um, was under attack, whether he was honest to the nation, whether the government of the Republic of Zambia had reached an agreement or a deal uh, over KCM with Vedanta. What seemed not to be sitting well with, with the public and many people was the fact that an announcement was made and yet no agreement was signed. One of the answers he gave me on the interview is that uh, your ministry is part of a technical team working uh, on mm. this thing. Many Zambians were finding it difficult when he says we entered into a sort of verbal agreement. And I asked him whether the Attorney General's chambers uh, were working on something. And he says the Ministry of Justice is on this technical committee. 
What is the legal position of government and Vedanta over case? Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll speak generally uh, so as to, to clear the air. Parties do engage in negotiation uh, and reach a consensus on what they want their agreement, their, their um, yes, their agreement to look like. Uh, and in, in the banking sector, what we would do, we would reduce the consensus that has been achieved into what we call heads of terms. And those heads of terms will give you a general direction on the, the highlights of what you want your agreement to look like. That's separate and distinct from the actual legal texts that you have to uh, enter into. So the Minister of Mines did not mislead the nation in any way. The parties know exactly what they want to achieve. They've reached what we call in law consensus ad idem, a meeting of the minds. That is normal. There is nothing absolutely abnormal about this particular way way in which commercial transactions are settled. So state council, when you with, go state into council, the text of... With, with all the respect I have for you the, and your experience, the the is, is, is there a legal agreement between the government of the Republic of Zambia and Vedanta? There, there is an agreement between the parties in terms of the term, the, 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 the contractual provisions that they want to see between them. How do we safeguard that these are not turned on while we are looking at the I's and the T's because we have an announcement which sort of explains the mm. framework so, of these agreements. So how does the announcement change anything? <laughs> I'm trying to understand where the challenge is. Because the announcement goes to, goes to talk you? about certain things that there's a billion dollar investment, there's 250 agreed, million yes. and things on. Uh, yes. If they've not been penned down and signed to, how do we safeguard that there's no U-turn on, on, on those? But the parties have agreed. What yeah. U-turn? Uh, Vedanta wants, wants to be able to continue exercising its rights as a shareholder. By the way, let's not forget that at no time did Vedanta not... Uh, there's no time at which Vedanta ceased to be a majority shareholder in KCM. Yeah. It's continued to enjoy those rights as a shareholder, notwithstanding uh, the, the, it, it, uh, the KCM being put in liquidation by uh, the, the, our colleagues uh, in 2019 thereabout. So, it's keen. So it wants so, so. to... to, to, to to enjoy its um, uh, its rights as a shareholder. So, so, so you are satisfied, as Minister of Justice, as a lawyer, legally, that we have an agreement. We have an agreement between the parties. They've reached a meeting of the minds as to what they want to see achieved in terms of this so-called comeback uh, of Vedanta. There's nothing. Uh, I'm wondering what the mischief is here. Who, who has been injured we, by what? We are seeking, <laughs> we, we are seeking clarity, Minister. All, we are seeking clarity. I, I hear you. I hear you. Thank but, you so much, yes, Minister. Um, so uh, unfortunately, we, we need to wind up. I've been hosting the Minister of Justice this evening, Mlambo Haimbe MP. We've been discussing the state of democracy in Zambia. Thank you so much for watching. Good night. And remember to catch our live stream on Facebook at Diamond TV Zambia as well as on YouTube at Diamond TV Zambia. Thank you so much. was brought to you by FQM Trident Limited, a subsidiary of First Quantum Minerals Limited.